Okay, folks, I am still waiting for Ethan Van Skyver's Cyberfrog 2 Wrecked Planet to drop. I believe that's supposed to be ready by the end of the month, uh, in which case I'm not sure how long it'll take for him to fulfill all the orders he's got. I mean, with, oh my gosh, I want to say there's been, what, one point, did he, did he raise $1.5 million with the crowdfunding campaign? So it could be several months, for all I know, before I see my package. I was one of the later... Uh, purchasers in that case. So uh, in the meantime, I'm going to be looking at the work of Comics Gate's teen sensation, Billy Tucci. Uh, we're looking at his uh, original intellectual property, She, and the very first series, The Way of the Warrior. Now, the omnibus for this just dropped recently, and it consists of 12 issues of She, The Way of the Warrior, plus... Uh, four interlocking issues, uh, Tomoe 0, 2, and 3, Tomoe number 1 being a reprint of uh, She number 6, and then uh, we also have She versus Tomoe, which takes place between She 8 and 9. So all of these interlocking issues comprise about 16 issues altogether, and like I said, the omnibus just dropped. And since that happened, and this is pretty much, this is close to being the, I want to say, 30th anniversary of She, which debuted in 1994, so uh, it's 2023 now. Uh, very, very close to being 30 years since this was originally published. And Billy Tucci himself, I think, hit the scene with this comic book. I don't know if he actually did any work for the big two or any other uh, major independent comics prior to this. It seems like he just fell out of the sky and started going gangbusters with this comic in particular and uh, took off like a rocket. And so his Marvel and DC work appear to come later in his career. Uh, I could be wrong about all of this. I was just going off the Wikipedia entry. But uh, he did some work on Marvel's Heroes for Hire, and uh, what he's most famous for working for the big two in recent years is Sergeant Rock, the Lost Battalion. But this is his baby. This is what he continues to put out property on even to this day. There's been many, many she series that, uh, that have spawned out of this original omnibus of she the way of the warrior. And so I'm just going to give... I. You know, I could try to critique all this, but at the same time, what's the point? It's 30-year-old material, and who knows how his techniques have developed since then. So I'm not going to bother you with a, a, a long kind of critique on it. Um, it's, it's just kind of out of date. But I did want to go over a cursory understanding of what the series is, take you through the plot lines, and tell you what I liked or didn't like about the series. So starting off, you open the, the book to a prelude. This is like maybe a third of the actual prelude, um, but it basically is describing things that happened way, way centuries ago. And generally speaking, you have these three particular clans of warrior monks. You have the Sohai, you have the, the Nara, and you have the Yakuza. And uh, they're all samurai of some sort. But these are the three main clans, and they're all kind of warring with each other until the Sohai lose, and they become kind of an outcast clan. And so she is kind of an outcast of an outcast clan, and that's how she's introduced in the series. Now, one thing that I have to say is that this did not really uh, dissuade me from my theory of scratch an independent comic and find a typo. <laughs> so uh, I will say that this typo was fixed in later issues of She when it was uh, when the prelude is repeated. But um, yeah, gosh, it's always it's always sad just to find a little bit of quality control that could have been that much better. So we start off with Hello Nurse. <laughs> My goodness, uh, I was actually not expecting uh, cheesecake at the start. Uh, we're having dessert first, it appears. Um, yeah, nude scene right up front, followed by even more nudity in a dream sequence, which is, I didn't post the nudity here, of course, uh, which ends up with her 
screaming out the name Arashi, which is the name of her nemesis. The name uh, literally means storm, and so she finds herself drowning in a storm. And when she awakens from her meditation, she realizes, okay, uh, it's time to make the donuts. Uh, let's go out and start uh, kicking some ass. So she dresses up in her ceremonial garb and then heads, hits the street to stop the uh, potential murder slash rape probably of a police officer, uh, lady cop, and um, she gets into a fight with the gang members who are assaulting the police officer. And here is introduced one of the pretensions of the series, which is an interspersing of present-day fighting with images of ancient Japanese fighting, which I found annoying as hell. It, it was one of those things where, you know, unless you could really dive in and associate her with one side and the gang with another side, the idea that we should have this imagery interspersed with um with the with the two sides fighting in ancient feudal japan just se seems i don't know it just seems gratuitous as if it doesn't matter it, it's something that's supposed to matter and yet doesn't matter it's it's just there to look pretty i guess so uh once all of this or uh, once this attack or uh, fight takes place and she's mopped the floor with all of them. Uh, it's investigated by the police, and we have two cops here, Joe on the left, Peter on the right, and if you're already assuming that she's going to be hooking up with Peter later on, you are not wrong. This is one of the most predictable things in the entire comic, the fact that she and this Peter, who is a detective in police force, is uh, that, that they're going to have some sort of relationship that's entirely predictable. So, in her secret identity, she is Anna Ishikawa, and Anna Ishikawa is a, uh, uh, procures artwork for the Oike Gallery, which deals in Japanese artwork, uh, rare Japanese artwork, uh, including a picture that is desired by Arashi, her nemesis. So I don't know if this is like a big coincidence or if she managed to navigate her way into this area, but she uh, is actually, it's, <laughs> it's going to be hard for me to disassociate between the pronoun she and the actual name she. I wonder how Billy Tucci does it on a regular basis. Um, so Anna is, uh, has somehow gotten in the middle of this transaction between Arashi and, uh, whoever it is that's, uh, the owner of the painting, and it is her job to procure that painting for him, and that is her way of getting close to him as well. Now, Arashi himself is a former hitman who took out her family, uh, specifically her father and her brother, and so she wants revenge on her nemesis, and he is not averse to killing in modern day as well, even though he has ascended up the heights of the Yakuza. Uh, he still doesn't mind getting his hands dirty himself, which is demonstrated when he kills a homeless man who he doesn't want around his property, and she, not being uh, ready to take Arashi on, can't do anything except watch and comfort the homeless man as he dies. In the next issue, and I'm not going to be going over the covers and such uh, until later, um, in the next issue we see how she was uh, raised by her grandfather uh, after the death of her father and brother. The mother is still in the picture, but uh, a little bit on the distant side. So, uh, so she winds up being under the tutelage of her grandfather, who is one of the Sohai clan, and so he teaches her the way of the Sohai. And uh, she is going to uh, take up the mantle and avenge her family is basically the mission that he gives her. And she basically is still uh, the next morning wearing the stains of the blood of the homeless man she encountered and is, is taking that of, as a sign of the commitment she needs to have to the mission on account of the bloodshed that has occurred because of Arashi. And she she's kind of conflicted about 
her mission because one of the things about the Sohai monks is that they have incorporated, at least into their belief system, Christianity. Now, I don't know if they're Christians in the technical sense, um, but you can see in the background over here how Anna has her own decorative cross in one of her rooms and wears a cross at times. So is Anna a Christian? And is Christianity in Japan, is it actual Christianity or is it an amalgamation? Especially when when you're talking about the Sohai clan. It's kind of hard to tell. And I think there are Christian themes that run through this book, sometimes explicitly when, when uh, some of the pages directly quote scripture. But one of the things we'll find is that Christianity is kind of a very complex religion, and it's very easy to get wrong in terms of uh, how it's portrayed. And if it's not taken seriously, if it's only like introduced on the surface or as, you know, kind of a running theme, you can really warp the way that it's presented. And just the fact that she is an ass-kicking samurai who's supposed to be subscribing to Christianity in which, you know, you're not supposed to be going out into the streets and killing people as a Christian, it, it makes for some confusing metaphysics. So let's just move on for now. Uh, we do move to a scene being witnessed by Arashi and uh, his second-in-command on TV dealing with a guy named Michael Campbell, who is a uh, murderer in police custody, somebody who uh, has some serious experience with killing, and, and for some reason... Uh, Arashi wants that man brought in, and we are led to assume that it is because he wants to use this Michael Campbell as a foil for she, and basically uh, because she is out there doing things like kicking ass and taking names on the lower echelons of Arashi's organization and kind of working her way up the hierarchy until she will finally get to Arashi's second-in-command and finally to Arashi himself. So here we have a scene in which uh, Anna is fighting one of uh, Arashi's underlings and something is going on with my PowerPoint presentation. Okay, there we go. We're back. Um, and she <laughs> bisects him nicely. So uh, he's no match for her and she uses his blood to scroll the character she, meaning death, on the wall. Now, the police kind of clue in that they might need somebody to help them with the Japanese cultural aspects of what's going on, and so the police detective Peter, he goes to see Anna at the exhibit and, uh, or at the uh, museum and, or art gallery, or where the hell she works, and uh, this is where they are introduced. So, they wind up going to lunch, and in the meantime, we see that the murderer has been delivered, this Michael Campbell guy has been delivered to Arashi, and rather than working for Arashi, basically his job is to be a crash test dummy for Arashi because Arashi is going to kill him. Uh, apparently, he Arashi wants to face off against a skilled murderer and make sure that his skills are still up to par, and his skills are still up to par. He makes short work of the Michael Campbell character, which really makes me feel like this Michael Campbell character was wasted. Um, not just literally, as in on the, on the screen, as you see, but also his potential was wasted. I mean, why not use him as a foil for she and try to, try to see if the she killer who is you know, decimating his organization might actually be taken out by this guy. It just, just seems like kind of a waste. Well, in an unexpected display of tenderness, Arashi holds a funeral for the men in his organization who have been killed by the she killer, whoever it is. And uh, Anna is one of the people who are invited to the funeral. When she realizes that the people whom she has been killing as she works her way up the organization they have families, they have loved ones. Uh, she just realizes, oh my God, what have I done? 
and she experiences kind of a spiritual transformation at this point in which she decides that she's not going to be a killer anymore. You know, she still wants her revenge on Arashi, but she's lost the killer instinct. And uh, that's going to come back and haunt her later. But, uh, but she does undergo this sort of um, baptism and born-again experience, again, evoking Christian themes to say that, you know, you can repent and then be redeemed in a way. And what's funny is that Arashi is kind of thinking things along the same lines in terms of repentance and redemption, because when he sees Anna crying over these men whom, you know, in his mind, she doesn't know them from Adam, you know, he looks at her and he says, well, you know, she's so pure and she's so lovely and so clean that, you know, maybe if I were to date her or something, you know, maybe maybe there's hope for me. And then he just kind of throws that out the door, you know. So, so there's an idea in which the idea of redemption rather than vengeance is something that is lodged pretty firmly in this series. And, and it is uh, an aspect of Christianity that uh, I think is supposed to be explicitly known through the series. It's at least implicitly known. But uh, Arashi at this point has already summoned, uh, being Yakuza, he summoned uh, people from the Nara clan. He summoned a, a six-member team from the Nara clan to come and exterminate the She-Killer, whoever it is. Um, I think there's only five people in the picture there. No, 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 there's six. Yeah, okay, good. I can count. Woohoo! I can count. Yes, yeah, so there are six people, and the leader of these six Nara clan members, whose mission is to exterminate any Sohai that they find, is Tomoe. Now, Tomoe actually is mentioned briefly in one of the prior issues of, of She as being an old friend of Anna Ishikawa from college. But it's so blink and you miss it, um, where you, you see the name, but it doesn't necessarily register at this point. So when I actually started reading and learned of this Tomoe character, I, I felt like I was reading about her for the first time. And what you see of her in this Zero issue is her tracking down and killing her competitor for leadership of the team of assassins that she is going to be leading. She makes short work of him and also uh, rescues one of her assassin team members in a scene that just makes you want to call bullshit on the whole series because you're looking at this woman carrying a guy who's like twice her size or at least twice her mass up up this ladder. It's like, give me a freaking break. I mean, there, I know it's a comic book, but this is a comic book in a comic book world in which people don't have superpowers. So wh why are we seeing this? Why are, why are we seeing a, a scene where a woman who is that diminutive, and I, I mean, she may be, you know, I, I don't know. She, she may be, you know, model size, six foot or something like that. But still, she's not going to be carrying a guy on, on one arm on her shoulder while she's carrying, while she's climbing a ladder up the side of a building. That's just, that's just give me a break, dude. Ah, oh, you know, it's like that scene in, in Transformers. I mean, yeah, there's giant robots fighting back and forth, but don't tell me at the end of a tiring day that Shia LaBeouf still has the adrenaline to, to run up five flights of stairs. There's just some things you can't do, or or better yet, in Cloverfield, when when the guy finds out his, his girlfriend is stuck at the top of a 47... Uh, story building, and he's got to go. He's got to walk up forty-seven flights of stairs. It's like, dude, she's dead. Let her go. You'll never get up there in time. God. Ugh. So anyway, Tomoe has uh, won her right to lead this team of uh, six assassins, including herself. And before she does that, she's going to go visit her old friend Anna Ishikawa, who she has no idea is the she killer. And, you know, it's funny because Anna and Tomoe, they are besties. I mean, they are just, you know, they are best friends from college. And to 
to see them interacting with each other and know that, you know, they're going to come into conflict later, it kind of sets up an interesting vibe. And, and that's one of the things that I kind of like about the series is that it, it sets up these coincidental relationships and then where, where you kind of start to like the people on both sides. And then you go and and put these people at loggerheads, and that makes the drama even more poignant because you realize that you know you kind of like both of these people. You are able to sympathize with both of these people. We're not quite at the stage where we're sympathetic with Tomoe yet, though. That doesn't come until one of the assassins that she's brought over gets his hands on Anna, and he's right about to kill her. When all of a sudden another so high samurai shows up and kills him, and it turns out to be uh, Anna's grandfather, so uh, Tomoe later loses another one of her assassins when a Tengu or a Japanese spirit. This is actually the first indication that there might be something other that there might be actually supernatural abilities in the world. But this Tengu apparently scares one of the assassins into falling to her death. And so now there are two dead assassins on Tomoe's watch. And that's the point at which you kind of start sympathizing for her because, man, she seems to be screwing up left and right. I mean, she's losing. She just lost two of her, her team. She's down to four people now. That's pretty sad. Now, meanwhile, on Anna's side, uh, she's having a reunion with her grandfather, but she's basically telling him, look, you know, I don't want to be a killer. And he's like, you know, that's kind of your job. And the mission basically says you're supposed to avenge your family. So he's not happy about that. In the meantime, we have a new character introduced, this Dr. Stephen Timmons, who is of the Civilian Review Board for the NYPD. He's the one who oversees the police. And uh, turns out he's kind of a bad guy, and he wants to ally himself with Arashi because his own interests have been impacted by the She Killer as well. In fact, I think it, I think the gang members who ganged up on the Lady Cop in issue one may have been actually working in his employ or in his organization in some way, shape, or form. So he wants to form an alliance with Arashi, but Arashi kind of blows him off. And so he leaves it to his own uh, strike team to try and find she, and and does draw a bead on she, but she does manage to escape. And now we have uh, Peter and Joe, the two de police detectives, getting closer to kind of tying she and Arashi together. And there might also be a connection with this uh, Stephen Timmons guy, and so they're getting kind of closer onto the scent. Of, uh, of what's really going on. In the meantime, you've got Tomoe, who's depressed over the loss of her two assassin friends, having a tearful farewell with Anna. Just, you know, just basically things have not, things have not been going well, but she has this duty to, to take on uh, more responsibility, and she still needs to, to kill this she-killer, although Anna doesn't know anything about that. And at this point, we still don't know... Um, or, or Tomoe still doesn't know that Anna is, in fact, she. Meanwhile, Anna has uh, her own reconciliation with her grandfather, and then she finds a note saying, meet me on the bridge. Now, it turns out that note was left w uh, by Tomoe, who sent away the rest of her assassin team, feeling like she couldn't protect them, and therefore she's a failure as a leader. So she's just going to uh, attack sh the she-killer herself. And it's while the team sent by Timmons to try and attack and capture uh, the she-killer, it's during that attack that she finds out that Anna is, in fact, the she-killer herself. And so she is the one, she meaning Tomoe, is the one who left the note for Anna saying, meet me at the bridge. So now we have the climactic battle at the bridge that's rec uh, recounted uh, in She versus Tomoe. <coughs> and in this case, we have... Um, one, of, one of the interesting things about this particular issue is that Billy Tucci really strove to make this a one-panel-per-page 
comic book, kind of in the line of the death of Superman or Savage Dragon number seven, where every single page contained one and only one panel with the exception of like this particular two page spread. And then there's another uh, page that kind of makes up for that by having two panels on it. So I think if you were to average it all out, you would see that there's probably one panel per page altogether throughout the book. And that does give things a kind of gravitas, especially if you believe firmly that this is going to be a fight to the death. Now, it doesn't quite turn out that way because what happens is a bolt of lightning interferes and uh, Anna winds up falling into the, uh, falling into the sea from uh, Tomoe's perspective. And Tomoe uh, basically vows to take up the cause that Anna had now that her friend is dead, and she's going to take up the mantle of she, which is totally unexpected. I mean, this is not this is not the way that I thought things were going to go. So now you have Tomoe return to Arashi and uh, and his second in command, and basically say that the she killer is dead, and they believe her, and then she goes to um, uh, Tomoe goes to uh, stop the kidnapping of one of the police detectives who is unfortunately hit on the head so hard that he winds up going into a coma but she does stop his kidnapping at least while dressed in the mantle of she she then uh proceeds to kill another of arashi's associates while he is at a party and that's when he realizes that tomoe lied and the she-killer, who he does not know is Tomoe at this point, is still around. In the meantime, since the two police detectives are getting closer to the Stephen Timmons guy in their investigation, Timmons takes the initiative and he basically frames uh, Peter, uh, the, the detectives Joe and Peter uh, as being crooked cops. Peter, of course, is very incensed about this, and he's equally incensed about the fact that his friend Joe is in a coma, and uh, he is told by a shadowy figure sitting on his bed that, uh, you know, he needs to calm down, and he basically says, look, when I want your advice, I'll ask for it. Remember, you're supposed to be dead, so stay that way. Like, yeah, yeah, it's, it's Anna, of course. Apparently, when she fell off the building, um, or off the bridge, he was there to catch her. In another instance of this is complete BS, because if, if she really fell from that serious of a height, there is no way he, at this point in the bridge, could have caught her. I mean, that, that just absolutely would have torn his arm out of its socket, or, you know, real, realistically, there's no way that she would have been able to keep her grip and she would have fallen into the water. I don't know if she necessarily would have died. You know, maybe they would have had something where, you know, she grabbed him and then, you know, he, she let go. And But it was enough to slow her down so that she didn't hit the water at breakneck speed. I could have believed that, but this is just, come on. Ugh. I hate it when I hate it when you know we're, this is not a superhuman comic, but boy, we're going to have people do superhuman things, kind of like what was it, Kickass number two, when uh, uh, who wrote that one, Mark Millar, Mark Miller? I always want to say Mark Millar because just you know M I L L A R, it just kind of lends itself to it. But if it's Mark Miller, okay. So Mark Miller, he writes that uh, you know the kid breaks his back and then he wriggles out of his costume. How do you do that? That that doesn't happen, okay? You broke your back. You're not moving anymore. Oh, my God. All right, so in the meantime, one of the assassins that Tomoe thought that she had sent away comes back to her and says that he witnessed the, uh, the, the she-killer surviving the fall, and so now Tomoe knows that Anna is alive. So she goes back and returns the she-duds to Anna, and... Uh, one of the things that uh, the police detective Peter is able to pitch in is that this Tengu uh, that was responsible for the death of one of her assassins uh, is named Pan, and you know he's just been in the city before, and they know of him, but they don't know much about him. 
that's a dangling plot thread that I don't know if that ever gets resolved. I, I, I don't know if there is any, you know, future She series that resolves this dangling pl uh, plot thread of the Tengu. Uh, it, if, it, if, it, if there is, it's something that comes after Way of the Warrior, which is kind of annoying because you kind of want this Way of the Warrior thing to be a self-contained deal. But I think already, just from the evidence of, you know, the Tomoe series, and also from the fact that um, you've got other she series that are starting to spawn out, like Tomoe and Witchblade. Uh, you've got uh, she Senraiuku. Um, you, you're already starting to see the development of a franchise. So you know it, it's kind of bothersome. And there's a there's even a manga she at some point, uh, which which recounts some adventures and are and are cited in the book. And it's irritating that, you know, here is this franchise developing when you haven't even finished the first series. It's like, uh, give me give me a chance here. But, you know, oh, well, you got to capitalize on the success while the iron is hot. So we also have a subplot where uh, Peter, uh, the detective, goes after the people who put Joe in the hospital. And it turns into a big shoot em up that devolves into a big stab em up and he gets his revenge. But it's not very long. It's not very long-lived revenge because Peter himself winds up getting shot all the pieces uh, during a flower shop heist that was set up in order to trap him specifically. So uh, he's now in the hospital and he's been taken out of play. So he's not going to be playing a role in the final conflict between Anna Ishikawa and Arashi, which starts off by Anna basically going to deliver the painting that Arashi wanted and being confronted by his second in command who has now come to the conclusion that Arashi is the she killer himself for some reason. Yeah, he, he and his, uh, and, and it's on account of his discovering a box that had a bunch of coins marked she and it was actually from Arashi's past as a, a hired gun um, but this uh, the, his second in command has come under the illusion that uh, these coins are things that he is distributing now and taking as signs of uh, being the she killer himself. Well, Anna goes ahead and reveals herself as the she killer, and Arashi, who has been standing there the whole time apparently, uh, also basically says, "Yeah, it's it's not me, it's her." But you know. At this point, uh, he reveals to his second-in-command that he used to be a hired gun, which does not go over very well with his second-in-command at all. Apparently, this is some kind of great betrayal and dishonor, and now the second-in-command is basically telling his troop of sword-wielding goons that uh, they need to kill Arashi. And so this <laughs> we have this kind of ironic scene in which she and Arashi are fighting together against the second command and his sword wielding goons and once all the goons are dispatched uh, the second in command kills himself in disgrace so now finally we're at the end and uh, we get the the uh, she versus arashi fight that we've been waiting for all this time and at the end of it uh, she actually does not come through and uh, we think she's about to be killed but arashi makes the startling re uh, revelation that it was apparently she's Christianity that was partly to blame for her own father's death because she's telling, uh, apparently uh, the father, her father, got the jump on Arashi and Anna started screaming, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not kill. And the father, distracted by Anna screaming, uh, was then killed by Arashi. And so, actually, she is responsible for the growth of Arashi into this, you know, minister of death, the, the, because it was her words that distracted her father from killing him. So she could, if she wanted to, blame herself uh, for all of the, the stuff that has, all of the evil that he's done over the years. But... For some reason, yeah, you know, he wants her to take that as reason for rebirth, as opposed to reason to condemn herself or something. Um, and then he 
in the meantime, is going to commit suicide, but he chickens out and decides instead to turn himself in and, and tell the police that he is the she-killer. And so he basically makes himself kind of a sacrificial offering, and you could say turns himself into a Christ figure because he takes on the sins that Anna committed when she was killing his echelons. And you know now he's become the sacrificial lamb, and that leaves her free to have more nude meditations. And uh, finally, we're left with a quote from 1 Corinthians where it talks about uh, how death has been swallowed up in victory and death where is thy, thy sting. So, so the idea being that instead of having this uh, vengeance arc that ends in death, you have this, this sacrificial redemption arc in which Arashi's sacrifice redeems Anna's life and allows her to move on without killing him. So, what do I think about the series altogether? Well, the first thing I gotta say is I did not care for the covers at all. I mean, I on a number one issue, I don't mind if all you do is display the main character. But, once you get on to issue two and beyond, you should be doing more than just displaying the main character. Especially if all you're gonna do is show the main character's face in various poses which is basically what he does for eight out of his 12 covers. It's like, my God, sell the book. You know, you probably did not attract all your potential customers with your number one issue. So you need your other covers to sell the book, to say, come look at me. You didn't give me a chance before, but give me a chance now. Look at how exciting that could potentially be. And if all you're going to do is throw your character's face up on the thing, I, I mean, it, it, you're just showing me the same thing over and over again. If I didn't buy it with issue one, I'm not going to buy it with any subsequent issue. Come on. There's actually only two issues where she's doing any other thing than sta uh, staring into the camera. There's one scene, uh, uh, she number eight, and you know, you've got this picture here, and then you've got she number 11, and I have no idea what 1918 to 1996 means. You have one particular, this particular cover to uh, issue 10 actually tells us something because the, I believe this is Tomoe who's wearing she's likeness and yet you see the real she outside the window. So this is actually a pretty good cover except if you're looking at it on the rack, this is all you see. I mean, you gotta give me more than that if I'm gonna buy the freaking book. I need to know what's going on inside. Now, like I said before, one of the things that was a little bit irritating was how in a lot of these fight scenes, you had um, present day fighting interspersed with past fighting. And one of the reasons why this was irritating is because the art style on both kinds of fighting is the same. You know, I'm more used, I guess it's because I've been spoiled by certain artists like, uh, I don't know, David Mack doing Kabuki or... Uh, um, you know, even even Bart Sears doing The Path, where you have these different art styles. And I would love to have seen the past fights done in a different art style, just so that I wouldn't get confused when I was watching, when, when I'm reading down the page, and I'm like, what the hell are all these people doing here? Oh, this must be, you know, a scene from the past. Okay, now we're back in the present. And then, you know, the next page be like, oh, that's another past scene. Oh, that's another future scene. If this was done in like kind of a, a the, the regular style first and third panels and then more of a painted style for the middle panel, that would have been a lot more conducive to, to easy reading because that would have been allowing me to make the transition instinctively, understanding that this was present day and past, et cetera, et cetera. I don't particularly like the fact that we started with cheesecake, you know, that we had that we had our dessert first, because honestly, when once you put her in costume, it just makes you wonder. All right, when's she gonna take it off again? Which you know doesn't actually happen until like the very last issue. Um, you know, that's not something that 
I really feel like if you're wanting people to come into your comic respecting your comic, that you're going to start off with a nude scene. I mean, that just, to me, that's just crass. Uh, it's almost like you're, you're, you're immediately putting it out there as titillation as opposed to, you know, I'm a serious comic, you know, or, or uh, this is a serious comic book. I want you to appreciate it for the seriousness it is. She couldn't have any kind of robe or cloth or anything over her. I mean, I don't know. That's that's just it. It it, it just felt wrong, and and it just continues to feel wrong even now that I'm finished with the series. Getting into Anna's head and into a lot of the characters' head is kind of difficult because on one hand, you know, we are working with a twelve issue series here, which you know comes across as being a limited series. Don't know how far into these people's heads we actually want to get, and it it always feels like there is a distance between, you know, between me and the characters. I'm not sure if I ever wind up liking any of these characters enough that I want to go on their emotional journeys. It, it's almost like these characters are are they're 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 very well thought out. But at the same time, I feel like they don't have their themselves put together where I would actually want to get in their heads. They feel scattered to me. They feel like, you know, they don't even know what they're doing at times. Like they are, they are subject to their own in, internal compulsions that drive them in a certain way and they're not in control of themselves. And I think that may be one of the themes of the book is feeling like you're on a particular path and then have to be broken away from that path. And because of the Christian themes embedded in there, it could be that the transforming effect of, of Christianity or, or of, uh, um, or, well, yeah, I mean, of Christianity that accomplishes that. Now, we also have things that wind up being predictable as hell, like the relationship that Anna has with the uh, younger police detective. But we also have things that kind of sway to, to completely the opposite of what we thought it was going to be, like the uh, almost immediate death of the murderer, Michael Campbell, uh, who I still say is a wasted character. But at the same time, it does show that Arashi's not just going to bring him in and use him as a hired gun. He'll wait until, you know, he brings the Nara in for that. And then you have, you know, Anna and Tomoe actually becoming besties. And, and that's not something that you would pick up e either from the previous issue of She where she was first introduced, which was only a couple of panels. You didn't necessarily know that there was, like, a good friendship struck and the fact that it was so blink and you miss it meant that once you got into Tomoe, you didn't associate that character with Anna's old friend. And so it was a complete surprise to me when I saw Tomoe at the uh, end of issue five going into issue six or wherever it was. Maybe it was issue six going into issue seven that um, that we see her meeting Anna. I thought I thought, number one, maybe they knew each other as uh, rival samurai. Uh, and that turned out to be not the case at all. So I feel like Tomoe's introduction was kind of bobbled in that respect because we never got a sense that the Tomoe we were getting from the Tomoe series and this Tomoe who was in Anna's life prior to these uh, events in She were the same person. Um, it's one of those connections that, you know, if you're really paying attention, you'll make the connection. But if you're not paying attention, it's like blink and you'll miss it. And you'll just think that this is a, a possible conflict just waiting to happen when actually it's, it's all going to be laugh and love and all that kind of stuff. But that does, the fact that they are friends does lend pretty well to their final confrontation. And one of the things that I like so much, this, this is probably the most Japanese that the comic series is throughout all of its, uh, throughout all of the work done in this series to, to deal with Japanese culture and all that. I feel like the conflict between she and Tomoe is the most Japanese element of it. And the reason I say that is because 
if you've ever watched the Mobile Suit Gundam series, one of the things that they do in those series, um, that, that anime series out of Japan, is they set you up with sympathetic characters on both sides of a conflict. And the conflict is known, but the characters are not necessarily known to each other, but you, you learn to like both characters. Or the, you, lear, you learn to like the good guys on the one side, and you learn to like you know, the good guys on the other side. You, know, you, you have a war, but it's not necessarily true that either side of the war is, is wrong. It's just they're different. They're different sides, and you come to like the characters on both sides. And what that causes is that <coughs> when you finally bring these main characters on both sides into conflict, you're so torn and you're so hurt because all of these characters are people who you have come to be emotionally attached to, and now they are fighting each other, and some of them might not survive. And, and very often in the Mogul Suit Gundam series, they don't survive, and it's torture watching these kinds of series take place. And that, it, at least that feeling was evoked. It's not a one-to-one -one comparison, but at least that kind of feeling got evoked by this particular sequence between she and Tomoe in what would be their final battle. And obviously I was not expecting she to effectively lose the battle and then have Tomoe take up the mantle of that. And, and that's something that, you know, God, you could really go for a long time with just a motif like that if you wanted to. It was really sad, though, that you can't believe it. You know, it, it's one of those things where unless she was actually hit and incinerated by the lightning so that her charred corpse fell into, this, into it and we saw all this, there's no way we're really going to believe that she's dead. And, and that's kind of sad because you kind of want to invest in Tomoe as being she now, but you can't because you know that you've only got like three or four issues left in the series and she is going to have to come back. I mean, obviously she's not really dead and obviously Tomoe is not going to continue as she forever. So there's just too much dangling. It's too predictable at that point. That's, that's one of kind of the weak points in the series, although it was kind of a big switcheroo and, and, and interesting while it lasted. Uh, it's kind of like when, uh, what's his name, uh, Dan Slott wrote about the superior Spider-Man when Dr. Octopus took over Spider-Man's body and he was going to be a better Spider-Man and he was going to be a heroic Spider-Man and commit himself to it. And, you know, we I wanted to emotionally commit to it myself. And the problem was, and I think this was something that was actually forced on Dan Slott, by Marvel, and it was a huge mistake in any case. Um, they basically had the ghost of Peter Parker show up, like, in the first issue, kind of letting us know right away that this was not going to be a permanent thing. And that really took away any, any reason to commit to the character as the character was now. And so having this kind of, you know, lightning bolt taking Anna out and killing her, quote-unquote, in a way that made it obvious that she was still alive, that really took away any reason for us to commit to the Tomoe character as she was. I mean, if she had actually, like, plunged all the way into the water, you know, and, uh, and we were able to see that, and, you know, there, there might have been a way to do it, but, God, it, it just would have been... I can't imagine a way to do it convincingly. I mean, I almost think that you would have had to see, like, her completely charred corpse fall into the water or something. You know, struck by lightning, blown apart, blah, blah, blah. Uh, there, there's no other way in, in, in the world of having read too many comic books doing exactly this kind of stuff that we're going to believe that Anna was ever dead. And then, of course, you have the final climactic fight between Arashi and Anna, and to have Anna lose and then have this uh, redemptive stuff played, um, I mean, I know, that, I know that that's kind of the point. 
It's just I've, I've encountered this before, and I won't say what series it is because it would kind of be a spoiler if I did, but there were like there was a four-volume series I read once upon a time where the first three volumes were just like increasing cycles of violence spiraling up and practically out of control. And then the fourth volume was a complete bait and switch where all of a sudden it became about disconnecting yourself from that cycle of violence. And I can't describe just how cheated I felt because I wanted to see some kind of hyper-violent re resolution to the story. And I feel like that is what I got robbed of here as well. But I also feel like that's deliberate. And it is that idea of Arashi instead of, you know, he's the villain and yet she in a way redeemed him in such a way that he can turn himself into the sacrificial lamb that prevents her from going to jail later on. I mean, I kind of understand it and it's, it does it does carry forward some Christian themes, but this is where this is where I really feel like you don't get a good whole grasp of Christianity out of this. I mean, it, you know, like dealing with the, uh, uh, what do you call it? The, 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 this would be kind of her born again sequence in which, you know, she realizes that she's killing people who have families. And then so she, you know, thinks of herself as descending into this pool and then rising from the pool, redeemed from her killer thoughts. And then you also have this, the same way you've got uh, the sacrifice of Arashi so that Anna can go, you know, free. I understand kind of the Christian themes around that. It's just that it really grates on me that we came all this way not to get a payoff, not to get a real payoff as to, you know, seeing Arashi gets what's his. Um, although I guess you could say that the fact that he's, you know, assuming responsibility for crimes he didn't commit and probably will assume responsibility for crimes he did commit. Well, maybe you could consider that, you know, what it is. And then, of course, we get nudity at the, at, again. Like, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know about this book. So, you know, maybe years later I will read this series again and, and understand better what kind of themes were trying to be carried forward. I think I understand now, but she, the way of the warrior, just struck me as as not something that, you know, given a choice, I will likely pursue any further than I already have. I think I pretty much had my fill of these comics and this universe, especially since there are so many she series uh, that have spun out of this. I, I don't know if I could handle having to catch up on 30 years of she. Um, that would probably just blow my mind and it... Yeah, I don't know. This th this series really was not my cup of tea. I mean, your mileage may vary. Uh, but I... Man... You know, I have OCD to some extent, and, you know, I, I, I can already see myself going to the Wikipedia entry to try and figure out how would I have to read all of this stuff in sequence. And it, it just makes me want to, you know, take a gun and blow off one of my toes so that the pain will distract me from ever actually carrying out such a plan. That's, that's really how I feel right now. But in any case, I hope you've enjoyed this retrospective on She, the Way of the Warrior, um, Billy Tucci's original magnum opus, uh, his, his what may have been his debut series for all I know, uh, because his, his Wikipedia entry sure was sparse of details, and I was not about to like you know go plumbing the depths for bio biographical material. But uh, I always have been curious about what the draw was, and I think I understand. Uh, in some way, how how uh, the this series resonated with people. He is a good writer. He he is a good artist. 
Um, I really had very little to complain about in terms of uh, the art and the writing styles. Um, and so if this is something that you think you might be interested in, you know, go ahead and give it a try. I will provide a link to the omnibus in the video description. And once again, this has been She, the Way of the Warrior. Please subscribe so that the next uh, time I cover one of these um, uh, comic series, you will be notified, and I will talk to you later.